Uh, our first uh, candidate tonight is uh, the Dem a Democratic candidate, the Honorable Bill Thompson. Welcome, Mr. Thompson. It's a pleasure to be here. Good evening, everyone. So I don't need to tell you because you've uh, been on the Board of Education, ran the Board of Education for some years, but uh, I will, to set the table, our schools educate about 1.1 million students on a budget of about $20 billion. Of that 20 billion, a little over 300 million, uh, or one and a half percent goes to teaching about and making music and pictures and sculptures and film and dance and theater. So total cost, 20,000 per student per year. Arts education, $300 of that $20,000. Would you make it a priority of your mayoralty to increase spending on the arts in the schools? And if so, in the ballpark, how much? I, I, I think it's always dangerous to pick a number exactly. But one of the things, and, and look, I think a lot of what you believe in is some of the things that you've done. I'm a New York City public school graduate, and I went to Midwood High School. I still remember what it was like playing the viola at Midwood High School. Now, I might not have been that good, but I was in the orchestra, and it, it, was, it taught so many different things. It taught discipline, and it's mathematics, and it's achievement and accomplishment, it's the things that you feel as a young person that really, while you may not be that good, it helps to boost your confidence. When I was at the Board of Education, and one of the things when people say, what are some of the things that you're proudest of when you were president of the New York City Board of Education? It was helping to bring art and music education back into the public school system. We made major commitments to it. We invested in art and music education because it was good for our students. And one of the more depressing things is in the last 10 years is to having watched that leave a public schools again. It has been taken out of a public school system. What I am in favor is investing again in art and music education within the schools. And it's not, you know, it, it doesn't have to be done from a central location. One of the things that we did that was excellent was we worked with community-based organizations, with artists in the neighborhood. They were on an approved list. Organizations and schools were able to kind of not work off of a one size fits all. They were able to pick and choose whether it was visual arts, whether it was instruments, whether it was vocal, what, a number of different things, they were able to do that. So I wanna bring art and music education back into a public school system. I think it's important that we baseline it again and don't allow, no matter what happens in the future, we can't allow those dollars to be taken out. So by baselining, in, among other things, do you mean this 60 odd million dollars a year that was uh, 15 years ago put in place to fund specifically arts that the Bloomberg administration six years ago said, no, spend it on whatever you want, principals. It would have to be, it would be baselined. I'd want a mandate, you know, with principals that that money has to be spent for art and music education. We'd want to work with them to help to develop, you know, kind of go back again on a community basis, which art and music, you know, education should be in each school. Work with them, let the schools make the decisions. As a matter of fact, it'd be nice for a change to involve parents in that discussion also and bring them into that conversation. But I'd want to baseline that money. I'd want to make, I want to mandate that it has to be spent in, and it needs to be more than $60 million. It has to be more than that. And make sure that it is used for art and music education. And then again, make sure that when times change, that that money's there, that that discretion to be able to use it for other things isn't there, it has to be useful. So, so in other words, because it's always easier to cut arts education, uh, you would you would segregate a certain budget line so that in tough times it it remains at some basic sustainable level. Absolutely, and and one of the other things, you know, the only way that is going to stay, and the only way that it's going to be there is as part of your evaluation for schools, for principals, for other administrators. You'd have to include that. How have they gone about bringing art and music education back into a school system, and how each and every year. How is that, how is that continued in a school? I think it's important when particularly, you happen to have, and, and, and one other thing. I remember as a child in a school trip, going to visit the Museum of Natural History. And it was almost a, a love affair with dinosaurs when I was a child, because I had the opportunity to go and to visit. And I still remember to this day, and that was a number of years ago, 
We have to have an opportunity for our children, again, our public school children, who are in the middle of arguably the art capital, art and music capital, the, the cultural capital of the world. Let them get back and do field trips so they can go and see some of the wonders that exist around them in all five boroughs. We need to do that again also. You, you said we need, because these days, we're, the, it's all about accountability and holding teachers and principals accountable for measurable success. It's easier to measure success on standardized tests about reading and math than it is your progress on the viola. Uh, ha, ha, so how, how ought arts education and, and its success or unsuccess be measured in our schools? There are some things that you can't measure. And I'd want to make sure, how can you measure? Has it been restored to schools? I think that's the measure, is in each and every school, have you brought art and music education back? Because the truth is, in the end, you know, the one thing, there are things that you can't measure. What it means to a child to be good in something, to have the opportunity to play an instrument, and one of the great crimes these days is in visiting a school and hearing that there are instruments in the basement that haven't been used in years, and the principal would love to do it but there's no money to be able to do that. And I think it is in, in bringing art and music education back. Those are things that some children who may not be great in academics, it brings them back again. It brings them back the next day because they'll have the opportunity to sing and because they're good at it, or the opportunity to be able to paint and they're good at it. It's a way to be able to express themselves, a way to be able to build confidence, and it opens up a universe, a very different universe for them. That's what, and, and there is no way at times to be able to measure that. But, you know, in, at a certain point, in the long run, it should lead to lower dropout rates. It should lead to higher scores because a lot of children, because they're there, well, I want to make sure that I can participate. I want to make sure that I can do certain things. Let me work harder in my academics. It's all part of the things that you can't measure, but that you can feel. Right. Rick Beneke um, pointed out some things. I'm going to repeat a few of them. Uh, WMI, uh, New York City, I, I always say WMIC. I don't know why it's kind of I, I wonder <laughs> why. <laughs> NYC nonprofit culture attracts over 98 million visitors to over 100,000 events, e exhibitions, performances, and uh, it attracts 23.8 million tourists to New York, generates an estimated $8.1 billion mm -hmm. a year, which is a major contribution to the city's economy, generates over 120,000 jobs which also stimulates the economy, and yet it receives, as Rick pointed out, one quarter of 1% of the overall city expense budget. Uh, we subsidize banks, we subsidize other corporations to keep them in the city, and yet uh, many of these places are being driven out by high rents and high property costs. So, with that in mind, as mayor, what are your views on providing funding to the arts and cultural organizations? Do you feel that increasing the city's financial commitment to the nonprofit cultural community to a full 1% of the municipal expense budget is a realistic goal? I, I don't know in the current environment if it's realistic to say that we're going to jump to 1%. I think that we want to see an increase in expenditures in not just capital money, and, I, and let me, you know, I will say the Bloomberg administration has increased capital expenses, and that's good for arts and music groups. That's good for our culturals. But two things, over time, we've got to continue, we have to increase our expense, expenditures with culturals. We have to also, and, and my wife is here, uh, and, you know, Elsie McCabe Thompson. My wife was the head of the Museum for African Art. If I also don't mention not just some of the larger culturals and those in the CIG, but some of the smaller cultural groups that we have to look at also to be able to increase funding to them. Uh, and as well as, and a lot of those groups are spread out across the city of New York. They're not just in Manhattan, they're in all five boroughs. So do we, is it 1%? I don't know that that's the magic number. Do we have to increase expenses or expenditures and money in the city expense budget? The answer is yes. Well, the answer is definitely yes. During the Koch administration, uh, the, a lot more money went to the, the arts than since. Uh, Bloomberg feels that philanthropists should give money, but if you're a small dance company, or a small theater company, mm -hmm. uh, the, the philanthropists aren't going to give you any money. So um, this is a reason that 
uh, these institutions, these nonprofits, depend on the city. And uh, other cities are doing things to attract them. They're actually luring them away. They're luring artists away. Well, I, I, as I said, I agree that we have to increase our expense allocation to arts uh, and to culture in the city of New York. Is it going to get to, I mean, can we set a goal at trying to get to 1%? That's a good idea. Well, what if Growing you think of them as businesses? Mm -hmm. Because these organizations are businesses. How might small business services and the New York City Economic Development Corporation serve them better? Well, I think in, in starting to highlight those organizations and providing the opportunity, giving the information out there about the smaller groups that exist across the city of New York. That would be a huge start about providing the opportunity or making the public and tourism aware and understanding that as tourism has continued to increase, you look at you know, some of our museums, they're in the top 10 as far as tourist attractions in the country. And that's why people come to New York City. A lot of them come for the cultural institutions. We want them to grow. But at the same point, we also want to continue to grow those culturals across New York City, tying in New York City and company and, and tourism to you know, cultural organizations and some of the smaller ones in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Staten Island, in the Bronx, as well as in parts of Manhattan. Some of the great and small dance organizations uh, aren't receiving a lot of money. And those are areas, as they pointed out, the city can increase its allocation of dollars to. The Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, would like more money, but they don't need it. It's that little organization. Um, I just want to point it out. I might, I might not have said that directly, but, <laughs> but someone else did. And that's all we have time yeah, for. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wow.